thank you for joining this briefing on the strategic case for a ceasefire in Gaza. This panel was organized by the Friends Committee of Na on National Legislation, Demand Progress, and the Quincy Institute. My name is Odelia Matter, and I'm the Program Assistant for Middle East Policy at FCNL. I'm also an Israeli citizen and have moved to DC three months ago from the city of Be'er Sheva in Southern Israel. My family and friends remain in Israel while friends and colleagues in Gaza and the West Bank continue to update on the unfolding horrors they are experiencing day by day. One thing is clear to us all, and that is that this nightmare has to end. Over the past two months, we have witnessed incomprehensible death tolls in an ongoing war, slaughter, hostage taking, sexual violence, a dire humanitarian crisis, and a looming health crisis unfold before us. What remains unclear is what future prospects might look like and how they will serve the betterment of all people in the region. I'd like to welcome Dana El Kurd, senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington, DC. Paul Pilar, non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Security Studies of Georgetown University and the Quincy Institute. And Daniel Levy, president of the US Middle East Project. Each panelist will give a five to seven minute presentation and then we will have a 25 minute Q&A section. We'll ask all panelists to address the topic question of this briefing. What is the strategic case for a ceasefire? Following panelists' presentations, we'll be addressing questions that have been sent to us before this briefing. Please use the Q&A function in the Zoom task or question, which we, we may address if there is time left. So first, I'd like to start with Dana, Dana El Kurd. Dr. El Kurd is an assistant professor of political science and a senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington, DC. She is the author of Polarized and Demobilized, Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine. Dr. El Kurd's work focuses on authoritarian regimes in the Arab world, state society relations in these countries, and the impact of international interventions. She earned a PhD in government with concentrations in comparative politics and international relations from the University of Texas. So Dana, you've been following internal Palestinian political dynamics closely, as well as impact of international interventions on these dynamics. Could you lay out from your perspective what you see as strategic reasons for a ceasefire? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me and, and um, for holding this really important uh, panel discussion. Um, I'll get into the strategic reasons for a ceasefire as I as I go through like the, my prepared remarks. I was asked first to comment on um, the humanitarian uh, uh, crisis and whether or not the pause that we saw was sufficient, and then also to talk about the current dynamics in the West Bank um, and and uh, how that relates to what we're seeing in Gaza. So it'll culminate in answering this question. Um, so first, um, the pause we saw, which is now over, of course, uh, the pause we saw in fighting was not sufficient, obviously, to address the humanitarian crisis. Uh, there are now expectations that over 90% of Gazan residents will be uh, below the poverty line. Fighting obviously has now resumed. Um, so that means that the UN, the UN estimates 1.8 million have now been displaced. That's over 80% of the population in, in the Gaza Strip. So people, even in the South, um, are finding themselves more and you know surrounded by tanks, surrounded in, in smaller and smaller uh, contained areas. Um, so even in the south, they're getting leaflets to evacuate. Some some of those leaflets say go to Rafah. Rafah has a border city that is closed. So as Mark Lynch wrote on social media, like it, the idea of asking people in the Gaza Strip to evacuate is is a cool joke. Um, and very importantly, there was a new investigative report by 972 Mag. Um, that found that the rate of civilian casualties that has been deemed acceptable um, in, in uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the, how the IDF functions has risen exponentially. And this is according to IDF sources um, that the, that the uh, report cites, as well as the use of AI to generate these targets. Um, they're generating targets at such a much higher rate than ever before, means they're making a target of even something like a small scale government worker because they're counted as Hamas. Um, so what that means is that, you know, the, the, the scope of the destruction really we've never seen before. And there really are no answers for where these people are expected to go if the violence continues, what the end game is. Um, when you look at some of the statements from the Israeli side, it's the, the objective is that they want to eradicate Hamas. And then there are particular actors who have outlined, you know, 
a buffer zone and things like this, which we can get into if people are interested. But the idea of eradicating Hamas is, I think, very problematic um, because Hamas experts agree that it's not really a sustainable or, or a, a valid objective. Um, not only is Hamas kind of a varied organization with some element of that organization outside of the Gaza Strip. So they're, they're not, it's, it's not something that can be uh, by force eradicated, but it also has an ideological component. Um, and you can't really eradicate the ideological component that fuels something like Hamas if the grievances continue. Um, the grievances that led to the emergence of something like Hamas have not really gone away. In fact, they're being exacerbated, obviously, by the, by the ongoing uh, fighting. I think the second kind of assumption in that objective is that Hamas equals armed resistance. And that, like, when you think about armed resistance, it's Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And, like, if you eradicate them, then you, you get a handle on the security situation. But I, that's also an assumption. Um, armed groups, for example, in the last two years have emerged in the West Bank that have been completely unrelated to Hamas. So the question needs to be, why are armed groups emerging? And how do you resolve that problem for you as Israel, you know, from the Israeli perspective? Uh, the, the level of eradication that we're seeing will not be, uh, uh, will, not will not give you a resolution to that conflict. Um, so yeah, so that's that's that. So in the meantime, all, you know, this kind of policy is just leading to a population being eradicated. And the anger, I think, that is being bred in Palestine as well as in the region makes the possibility of a political or negotiated uh, resolution or way through this crisis or th even through the entirety of this conflict even more elusive. And so I think that this is setting up for more mass violence rather than less. Now, um, to talk about the day after, uh, lots of people have discussed this and have thrown around different ideas. What happens if you are able to say, like, we've eradicated most of Hamas or we've eradicated the militant wings or, or you know, we've achieved some level of destruction that's, that's uh, um, acceptable, acceptable to us? Um, what happens to the actual, you know, Palestinians in Gaza? What happens to actual governance there? So some ideas have included that there is going to be an Israeli occupation of Gaza, reoccupation of Gaza um, directly. Uh, obviously, other elements of the occupation have persisted, but direct occupation. The U.S. has said no to that. Um, there's been this idea that there might be Arab forces to, you know, hold the peace or or be involved in some way in Gaza. Arab governments have rejected that. Then there's the idea that the PA might take over, so the the PA leadership might also start to govern Gaza or like you know uh, um, uh, serve a role that way. But the PA has been very reticent about that as well. And the reason they've been reticent about that is because the PA has very little legitimacy. Um, and that's by design. Um, so in the latest polling from September 2023, we found that 24%, or sorry, not we, I was not involved in this poll. Um, I'm involved in other polling. The Palestinian Center for uh, Survey and Policy Research has found that 24% um, of respondents, Palestinian respondents in both the, in both the West Bank and Gaza uh, said that um, uh, Fatah, the dominant party in the PA, uh, um, only 24% said that that party is deserving of leading the Palestinian people. So very low levels of legitimacy and popularity. And I think um, that brings me to what's happening in the West Bank. Just very briefly, I know I'll, I'll try to stay within time. Um, so as I said, in the, in the Palestinian Authority is very legitimate in the West Bank. It's been hollowed out by international intervention um, it's been hauled out of any kind of real governing authority aside from coercive power, which is itself very unstable. Um, and the PA and its allies have also blocked any alternatives from emerging um, in, in uh, Palestinian politics. So whether through elections or any kind of actual accountability. So that's the scene uh, that we had in the West Bank on the Palestinian side. And even before October 7th, the West Bank was also witnessing, you know, very high levels of violence, uh, the highest level of settler violence since 2006, um, and and the empowerment of these settler gangs, basically with with IDF support, as well as the emergence of the of these local militias and armed groups that I discussed in the Palestinian urban centers, which again were unrelated to Hamas. So we're seeing um, since October 7th, or sorry, before October 7th, there was kind of this policy of like land grabs. And attempted forced displacement of Palestinian villagers in particular areas in the West Bank. 
Um, uh, and in the aftermath of October 7th, what we're seeing is that it's, you know, the war has given the current government, which has extremist settlers in its in its cabinet, like Bezalel Smotrich, the ability to kind of hasten the land grabs um, and, and um, hasten the forced displacement of Palestinian villages. Up to 16 have been completely uh, uh, um, er eradicated at this point in, in parts of the West Bank, 16 villages. Um, and also, engage, you know, they're engaging in a mass arrest campaign. So the Palestinian Prisoners Club says over 3,000 have been arrested. Um, and there's been um, widespread reports of torture and abuse uh, where Palestinian prisoners are not allowed lawyers or Red Cross visits or anything like that. Um, and all of this is really, I think we need to understand it as part of um, basically an, an, a de facto uh, plan. It's it's not the, um, you know, the, the, the law of the land necessarily, but... It's a de facto plan that Smotrich outlined back in 2017. He called it his decisive plan, where he can either the, the Israeli government can either transfer Palestinians, make them surrender, or uh, kill them. So the West Bank violence that we're seeing, whether before or after October 7th, so definitely there's there's been a, a huge uh, uptick in in that after October 7th. It really should be seen as part and parcel of the violence we're seeing in Gaza. Um, obviously, it's not the same mode or the same intensity. But it's part of the same problem, and the, that problem is an Israeli policy of ignoring Palestinian national claims, um, operating with impunity, very little or no international pressure, and assuming that this this kind of status quo of Palestinians continuing not to see progress on their national claims and continuing to be subjugated, it can be sustained by force. That's the assumption. So the U.S. government has um, talked about, you know, in since October seventh with the Biden's op-ed and stuff like that. They've talked about the two-state solutioning and returning to that framework, even though a large part of why we were off that framework was because of US foreign policy, uh, sidelining Palestinians very aggressively in the last couple of years. Uh, but in any case, the two-state solution, um, they've been talking about it. They're saying they won't give visas to extremists, settler extremists. But at the same time, the US government has been providing cover for the latest war, vetoing resolutions at the UN, fast-tracking military aid. So all of the things that they have tr you know, started to float um, around possibly changing or, or possibly pressuring the Israeli government a little bit is, is a little too little too late. Um, so I'm sure it's going to come up in the discussion as well uh, uh, around like Israeli leaders and, and what the Israeli side looks like. Um, but I mean, I think it's it's very clear to everyone involved that even not including Netanyahu, like we're talking about others in the Israeli political spectrum like Gantz, they also have very little interest in the two-state solution and and the Israeli public is is increasingly right-wing as well. Um, so the irony of the, the fact that the US has not only bungled this moment, um, bungled is like too soft a term, but the, not only have they done that, but have really forfeited um, any ability to interfere uh, and intervene kind of positively uh, and given their, you know, failed foreign policy, you know, the, the last decade or so, or maybe even further, um, is is really tragic, actually, because U.S. intervention would be most impactful, um, given the kind of increasingly zero-sum conditions on the ground. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it there. Sorry if I went over time. Um, but yeah, I look forward to the Q&A. Donna, really appreciate your informed and important insight on this issue and excited to hear more from you at the Q&A as well. Um, next, we'll hear from Paul Pilar, who is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Security Studies of Georgetown University and the Quincy Institute. In 2005, Paul retired from a 28-year career in the U.S. intelligence community, in which his last position was a national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. Earlier, he served in a variety of analytical and managerial positions, including as chief of analytic units at the CIA, covering portions of the Near East, the Persian Gulf, and South Asia. He's the author of several books on negotiation, terrorism, and U.S. policy in the Middle East, and is also contributing editor of The National Interest. Paul, you've had a long career in the U.S. intelligence community with both a regional and a global perspective. What do you see as the strategic case for a negotiated ceasefire, considering the regional implications of Israel's continued warfare in Gaza. Well, thanks for organizing this. Uh, let me begin by uh, addressing what cannot be accomplished through a continuation of this war if there's no ceasefire, bearing in mind that the history of the bloodstained Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including the loss of Israeli life at Palestinian hands, did not all start on October 7th. 
you know, the declared Israeli objective of destroying Hamas really leaves open a question of just what destroying Hamas would mean. And Dana has addressed this uh, to some extent. Let me just add a couple of more points. Hamas is not a standing army where if you killed all the soldiers and flattened all the equipment, you've eliminated both the organization and the threat. Among other things, besides being a social movement and a nationalist movement and a set of aspirations that can't be destroyed, uh, Hamas is the civil administration of the Gaza Strip, and it's hard to see how it could be destroyed without destroying most of the infrastructure and most of the population in the Strip. And perhaps the uh, the very expansive nation, nature of the Israeli assault that we've seen so far is tacit testimony to that fact. If we you know, interpret the Israeli assault uh, charitably as designed to go after Hamas as opposed to inflicting death and destruction for other reasons. Insofar as Hamas is a military force, it is, is and always has been far, far weaker than Israel, which is the most powerful military power in the Middle East. Hamas accomplished what it did on October 7th through surprise and through the failures of Israeli leaders to recognize that type of attack as a possibility. Hamas has now shot that wad. That's not going to be repeated for the foreseeable future. So there's no question of Hamas regrouping to try to repeat what it did on October 7th or to try to fight conventionally toe-to-toe -to -toe, with the most powerful military force in the Middle East. To the extent that Hamas is going to do more violence, it will rely on the future, as it has in the past, on asymmetric means of resistance, which do not depend on a ceasefire or an absence of a ceasefire in, in the Gaza Strip. If Israel gets to the point, as some of Netanyahu's comments have suggested, of basically reoccupying all the Strip, then there will be an insurgency. That insurgency will almost certainly continue as long as the occupation, even if it's not called that, continues. And I'd note that in the past, Hamas has also used individual suicide bombers, another violent and asymmetric means of resistance to strike at Israel, and it may do so again. But I think the most fundamental point to remember about Hamas is that it's only one organizational manifestation of the anger and resentment that have stemmed from occupation, blockade, and denial of human and political rights and self-determination for Palestinians. As long as the conflict underlying that situation continues, there will be violent resistance to Israel. If it's not Hamas in its present form that leads that resistance, then it will be Hamas 2.0, or some other group, perhaps one that hasn't even been formed yet, as well as smaller cells and individuals. The main strength of Hamas, or more to the point, the main threat to the security of Israeli citizens, lies less in any existing capabilities that Israeli bombs might reach, and more with the willingness of Palestinians, now and in the future, seeing that they have nothing to lose, to step up and replace whatever Israel has destroyed and to continue the resistance. The enormous death and destruction that Israel has been inflicting on the residents of the Gaza Strip increases the number of Palestinians who see that they have nothing to lose and are willing to take that step. Secretary of Defense Austin spoke to this point when he said in a speech the other day, and I quote him, in this kind of fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat, end quote. A continuation of this war, even if it reaches some point where Israel can claim some sort of victory over Hamas, spells a strategic defeat in terms of the safety and security of Israeli citizens. Or to put it differently, even if the security of those citizens were one's sole criterion, not caring about the lives and livelihoods of Palestinians, then to continue this assault and not accept a ceasefire is a strategic mistake. Now, of course, regarding U.S. interests, which we all have to consider, there are other considerations, including strategic as well as humanitarian ones. Resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is in the U.S. interest, as reflected in many of those recent statements by the Biden administration. Perpetuation of what's going on right now in the Gaza Strip is against U.S. interests because it makes resolution of the larger Israeli-Palestinian conflict less likely. It intensifies mutual hatred on both sides. 
It gives motivation and ammunition to any extremist who would try to undermine a peace process. It turns into rubble homes and neighborhoods where Palestinians would be expected to live contentedly ne next to Israel. And it moves Israeli policy ever farther away from peaceful resolution and farther down the alternative road of extermination and expulsion as a way of dealing with Israel's Palestinian problem. A further cost to U.S. interest of a continued war in Gaza is the risk of the war spreading in ways that could drag in the United States more directly. We've seen already an escalation of things like firings by militias in Iraq and Syria against uh, compounds that house U.S. forces. And now more recently, we've seen what's going on in the Red Sea with what the Houthis in Yemen are doing, who have been quite explicit in explaining their activities as all about what's being inflicted on the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. The main strategic disadvantage for the United States from a continuation of the current war is that most of the world sees it with good reason, sees the United States as sharing responsibility for what has become one of the worst man-made humanitarian disasters in the last half century. That perceived responsibility relates not only to the many years of diplomatic cover and voluminous no-strings-attached aid that the U.S. has furnished to Israel, but also in the current situation to proposals here in Washington to provide still more military aid, more than $14 billion worth, according to the administration's proposal that sits before Congress. As long as the current Israeli assault continues, most of that aid would not be used for anything that can credibly descri be described as defense but instead would be used for more destruction of the Gaza Strip and the human suffering that has gone with it. The resulting anger and resentment, not just toward Israel, but toward the United States, can redound to the disadvantage of U.S. interest in various ways, especially in the Middle East. There's already a boycotting of U.S. origin goods and services. Regimes, even authoritarian ones, that may have little genuine sympathy for the Palestinians, have to listen to the anger of their own populations. Some reflections of that that we've seen already have included Saudi Arabia putting on hold any more movement toward normalizing its diplomatic relations with Israel, which had been a major priority of the Biden administration, and the snub of President Biden by Jordan's King Abdullah when the president was in the Middle East, uh, resulting in cancellation of a scheduled meeting in Amman. And indeed, Jordan is probably the leading example of a government that has traditionally been friendly toward the United States, but is now being caught in a very uncomfortable bind by the Israeli assault and Washington's perceived acquiescence in it. With Jordan's large Palestinian population, to the extent that King Abdullah does stay friendly toward the U.S., he risks the very stability of his regime. You've got similar problems in Egypt. Uh, where the peace treaty between Egypt and, and Israel has, from Egypt's point of view, all been a matter of trying to stabilize things uh, in within Egypt. But now you've got the prospect of mass expulsions, basically, of Palestinians into the Sinai, which would be a horrible situation from the point of view of the regime of General Sisi. One last point. The anger with the United States regarding its perceived connection with the carnage in Gaza also increases the chance of terrorist violence hitting U.S. interests, including American citizens here and abroad. One of the most frequent themes in the statements, propaganda, and interrogations of terrorists who have attacked U.S. interests in the past has been anger over the U.S. connection to the Israeli subjugation of Palestinians. That comes up again and again and again. And so the longer that the war on Gaza goes on, and the more destruction that there is, the more this motivating theme will be getting revived. We've already heard just within the last couple of weeks, Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, issuing calls of arms and invoking the Gaza carnage. Those are substantial costs in my view, and I'll stop there. Paul, thank you so much for broadening the scope of how we see the strategic case for a ceasefire your perspective is much appreciated. Um, next, we'll hear from Daniel Levy, who is president of the US Middle East Project, which is focused on advancing a mutually dignified and acceptable resolution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Daniel Levy carries extensive experience in Israel-Palestine negotiations, served as the senior advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister's Office and to Justice Minister Yossi Belin during the Barak government, 
In addition, Mr. Levy was an Israeli official for the Israel-Palestine talks at Taba under Barak and at Oslo B under Yitzhak Rabin, as well as being a lead drafter of the model peace agreement better known as the Geneva Initiative. He is also a founder of J Street and has served on the boards of the European Middle East Project, New Israel Fund, and Molad. So, Daniel, drawing from your experience as a former Israeli peace negotiator, negotiator working so close to the Israeli government, could you please walk us through what the strategic case is for a ceasefire from your perspective? Yes, and thank you. And apologies that, um, as I'd said in advance, I, I, I was able to listen, but but um, only able to be in front of a camera now. But I did listen to Dana and Paul, and it's nice to see you both and, and everyone else who's joined us. Thank you for taking your time. Um, I guess given that you gave that extensive uh, bio background, I this is the time I, I feel least pride in having had anything to do with the founding of J Street. And I'll just say that and then we'll move on uh, because of the positions it has taken during this, uh, this, this period. I, I can't start without just riffing off something that Paul said and Dana touched on. And because this is an American setup and, uh, and, and, and those of you who are listening, uh, uh, I think mostly in the U S um, I think the American position has been appalling. I don't think things could have gotten this bad uh, without, you know, this isn't America looking at a crisis and saying, gosh, really difficult to bring this one to closure. I wonder if we have any leverage on either of the parties. How could we help here? This is America arming an actor that is almost certainly going to be investigated and found guilty, if that's a reasonable investigation, of having conducted war crimes with American assistance. And I think people should take seriously the idea that American officials are culpable in those crimes. I saw, I, I followed yesterday, you know, you have an Israeli cabinet minister come on the Sunday talk shows, Rom Derma, share a pack of lies, and then uh, John Kirby pops up straight afterwards and endorses those lies. 5,000 dead children and John Kirby, the, 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 what the Israelis are doing now with the QR codes, which if you have access to them, you're, you're lucky in the first place to still be able to get online and still have the, uh, the power to be able to recharge your device. Endorsing mass displacement, endorsing ethnic cleansing, and then turning around and saying, what other, what a fabulous army, what other army goes out of its way to protect civilians by sharing these areas? where people have nowhere to go. I mean, the level of inhumanity of your administration, as you can tell, has me in a rage. And I hope they pay a price. I hope they bloody pay a price. Okay, now I'll move on. Um, look, when I think about the, the necessity of of drawing this to a close, let me divide up into, into and, and I'll do it quickly because some of the arguments have been raised already. And I, and I actually was going to quote uh, Sec Def Austin, but Paul did already, because I think the most fundamental from a military perspective point that this is that Israel's entire approach to the Palestinian question is, is to take any manual of counterinsurgency and just get it totally wrong and turn it upside down. Uh, you know, for every person uh, that they think they're taking out, they're creating a new generation of people who will be drawn into um, even taking extreme measures. None of this justifies, of course, what was done uh, on October the 7th. But I think in many respects, Hamas has already won. You're not going to be able to defeat Hamas. You're playing into the hands of a party that is, is working, as Paul said, in an asymmetric warfare strategy. This was a colossal failure on the part of Israel. We are correctly told how horrendous the events of October 7th are, are, were. We're less told how horrendous every day since October 7th has been. But October 7th happened for many reasons, but if you shrink it into the most immediate causal factors, you had virtually no Israeli military deployed 
on the southern border with Gaza, um, because Israel's army does not act as is, is the Israeli Defense Force, which is its formal title. It acts as the protection of settler hilltop youth force. And that's where they all were. That's why you had all the, 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 the militants who came through the border, I think, could not believe, and, and we have things to suggest that this is the case, uh, just how easy that was, just how little deployment there was, just how little deterrence or immediate response. But stepping a little further back, the entire debate is misconstrued because you don't get security when you run a regime of permanent illegal occupation, which is predicated on deep structural violence and what has been designated as meeting the legal bar of a regime of apartheid by not only Palestinian NGOs and human rights groups, but Israeli human rights groups and the international organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. When you run a regime of structural violence, you don't get security. You can want security, you can think it would be nice to have security, but those things have never gone together in history and they won't go together now. Let me just run through a few other points that I think is worth, are worth mentioning uh, in terms of the failure of this, and, and it will continue to fail if you carry on. First of all, the, the, Dana touched on some of this, the effect it's having on Palestinian politics. In fact, having successfully, from an Israeli perspective, separated the West Bank and Gaza, you've now kind of forced those two things together. By the way, when Palestinians in Gaza, a community of refugees having been forcibly displaced during the, displaced during the Nakba from Israel itself, when they're displaced again, they're not just thinking about their homes in Khan Yunus, in Jabalia, in Shati to go back to. When, when Jake Sullivan, apparently with no degree whatsoever of self-awareness or irony, talks about the Palestinians should have the right to return to their homes in northern Gaza. Exactly. Dana's facial expression uh, completed my sentence for me, uh, which was to shake her head and go, oh, my God, you understand nothing, man. Sorry, I'm putting words into your mouth. Um, so that's one effect. Another thing, Paul touched on it, the potential of regional metastasization, but not just that, the extent to which this has stirred anger in the region. And people say, well, you know, no, people aren't out burning flags every day. I don't think that that's an accurate measure of what is going on. And it's not just in the Arab or Muslim world. Also, you see this moment of global solidarity, what some people have called a, a global George Floyd moment. This is incredibly counterproductive to Israel's interests to have, to have stirred this up, to be killing people at a rate phenomenally higher than anything that has happened in Ukraine in terms of civilian deaths. Is that how you want to set out your table on the global stage as Israel? The strength that Hamas is gaining in very significant spaces. People should watch very closely the anger in Jordan. Next, what this has done in terms of giving a headwind to something that was already on the ascendancy, which is Israeli extremism. So the kinds of, it, it's, it's kind of open season when it comes to who can say the most extreme thing in Israeli politics. So you already had a cabinet deeply committed to ethnic cleansing. But now you have, have former generals who, the leader of the opposition has just put out a plan. It's not a plan, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, a copy and paste of what Netanyahu is doing. Lapid put something out in Hebrew. But he, he, he was proud of the team that had put it together. Who's on the team that put it together? Well, one of them is a guy called Gyora Island. Gyora Island wrote a piece in which he said, a happy side effect of what we're doing could be mass disease in Gaza, which would take, take care of some of the Palestinian problem in Gaza. Natalia Smotrich then uh, retweeted that uh, and endorsed it. That's just one example of the, of the multitude of examples. And the ethnic cleansing genie has come so far out of the bottle that I don't know how easy it will be to put that back in. And that, I would argue, that overreach on the part of Israel is one of the most dangerous things that could possibly um, emerge from this from an Iranian perspective. I think for many people in the US, including in the US system, and I don't think we should take lightly what Sekdef Austin said and what the feeling inside the US military almost certainly is. Um, 
I think what this has done in terms of restirring that debate of Israel as strategic asset or strategic liability is very significant. And the lot I'm saying all this as things that have happened already, but the longer this goes on, the worse it gets. I think it's fascinating that when you've been running a campaign uh, on WMD, on the nuclear file, against another state in the region for years, you then have one of your own ministers threatening to use your nuclear weapon against the civilian population of Gaza. So can we really consider Israel to be a responsible nuclear power? Should we really be continuing to turn a blind eye to that reality, given what we've just heard? Um, and I will close just with one other thought, where if you take all that strategic stuff out of it, the equation, all the humanitarian consideration out of the equation, and I urge people to look at what UNICEF is putting out, what UNRWA is putting out, what the World Health Organization is putting out, what Dr. Tudras put out the other day, in terms of, because what we're seeing now is not just direct killing as a result of Israeli military actions, which target civilians. Let's not lose sight of the fact that on day one, the very first thing Israel declared it would do was to cut off food, water, medicine, all supplies to the Palestinian population. So collective punishment was the first go-to place. But even when you get beyond those who are being killed directly as a result of Israeli military assaults, you are now going to see increasing death as a result of lack of sanitation, spread of disease, absence of clean water, absence of hospitals, uh, etc. Now, even if that doesn't move you, I've got news for you. When all of that shit, and in this case, literally shit, goes out untreated into the Mediterranean Sea, it's a really weird thing. It's not just going to stay on the coast of Gaza. So you're actually, even from an Israeli, the narrowest perspective possible, you're going to cause yourself great harm as Israel. So um, on that um, rather unsavory thought, let me close. Daniel, thank you so much. Um, this insight, considering your rich experience and, and history both on the negotiation table and with other projects is so important given the situation. And I want to divert the next question to Dan. I know you don't have until three with us. Um, this is a com culmination of, of many of the questions we've been receiving uh, via the Q&A and also at meetings with Congress people. Um, so I'll start by saying a lot of attention has been focused on Hamas as a non-negotiable body towards a long lasting ceasefire in the region. Many Congress people are echoing and alluding to building a path towards a two state solution as a possible requisite for a long-term solution to this crisis. But I want to ask you if you think there is a possibility for Palestinians or whatever body represents them to negotiate for a two-state solution given the current posture of the government governing Israeli coalition. I mean, yeah, that's that's the big that's the big obstacle, right? Is that um let's assume that the Palestinian body whether, I mean, the Palestinian Authority or possibly the Palestine Liberation Organization as a representative of a wider range of Palestinians. Like, let's assume that like we get it up and running and working and Palestinians buy into it. And and I mean, there are pathways for that. I'm not suggesting that it's completely impossible. But um, even if all of that happens, there the Israeli political spectrum does not breed a lot of... Um, confidence in, in in having a partner for peace uh, uh, um, on that end either, because like I mentioned in my remarks, like even the people that are billed as centrists do not have an interest in engaging in anything but the continuation of the status quo, which is to continue to ignore the Palestinian national claims and continue really like not moving beyond um, the very limited way that the Israeli side understood the peace process um, and not at all absorbing the lessons of the last, you know, 30 something years of the peace process and the changes that they um, that have that have occurred um, on the ground and in and, and, and people's kind of uh, understanding of the conflict. Um, that's why I I think it will require extra regional intervention, um, but it has to be serious extra regional intervention. It cannot be the biased mediation that we've had thus far. 
And given, especially the Biden administration before and especially after October 7th, given their um, really problematic, to put it lightly, uh, um, uh, approach to this, I, I don't know that that is going to be acceptable. So the pro, okay, so a couple of problems. So I'm just gonna touch on it quickly before, before um, the end of my uh, remarks here. Couple of problems is that people assume that they can impose a Palestinian leadership on Palestinians without any kind of buy-in from Palestinian society. And that needs to be an assumption that like goes out the window. Um, whatever Palestinian leadership is in place, post Mahmoud Abbas, in, in, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in the PLO, whatever, needs to have Palestinian buy-in. So this whole American approach to only dealing with, you know, particular decision makers and, and elevating particular decision makers and overturning elections and doing whatever it is that they want to do, that, that, that can't work. It cannot work. You have to have Palestinian buy-in for whatever happens. Um, and then the, the, the second assumption is that the Americans not learn from the last, you know, 30 years of the peace process and, and the stopping of the peace process. Um, and not actually impose limitations on the Israeli side to make concessions. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that people have to keep that in mind um, about where this goes from here and, and, and not assume like some of the patterns of previous uh, uh, maybe conflict management techniques will, will work uh, in the future. People have to take Palestinian national claims seriously and stop assuming that self-governance is going to be, you know, is, is going to be enough or, or other, you know, carrots can can placate the Palestinian public. Thank you, Dana. Um, I'd like to divert the next question to Paul. Um, I, I want to just consider what both you and Dana pointed towards, how without it addressing existing grievances, we probably will see more armed bodies rise and insurgencies take place. I think you'd also mentioned that with or without a ceasefire, it is probable that Hamas will make efforts for an insurgency. Um, so do you think there is a way to ensure Hamas or others aren't given opportunity to regroup with a ceasefire? And how, how so? Well, I tried to touch on that before. And you have to ask, you know, regroup to do what? Um, there isn't going to be a repeat for the foreseeable future of, or maybe forever, of, of October 7th. I touched on it, and, and Daniel mentioned further some of the background of how the Israeli government was concentrating on protecting settlers in the West Bank. And there was you know, a very light presence in the South to the extent that even Hamas was uh, surprised as to how, how easy it could be done. And the, the Hamas leadership is not uh, dumb enough to uh, expect that they're going to uh, do very well trying to go head to head directly in any kind of conventional warfare against, as what I mentioned, is the uh, most powerful military in, in the Middle East. Uh, so th th there isn't going to be any regrouping for anything like that. And, and for, for the kinds of asymmetric threats to Israeli citizen security that either Hamas or other groups can pose, it does not depend on a ceasefire to do any regrouping. What it depends on is enough Palestinians who are angry enough and desperate enough uh, to be, you know, the next suicide bomber. Uh, and and that so that really is not a strike against the idea of a ceasefire at all. Uh, the the so-called regrouping is for stuff that's not going to occur in any case. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that answer. Um... Daniel, I'd like to ask you the next question. Uh, it's, a, it's a few questions bundled in one, but is first, if you could um, expand on Israel's goal of eliminating Hamas, is that attainable or not? And then what role does Hamas play in the conversation surrounding a ceasefire and post-ceasefire discussions? If you could maybe touch upon, you know, what ideally happens the day after a ceasefire from your perspective? Okay, um, I, I think we're well beyond ideal scenarios. Given uh, uh, Gaza was was being described as as borderline uninhabitable uh, before this this level of destruction, um, 
So uh, just to touch on these things, uh, Hamas cannot be eliminated. Hamas is a political movement that exists on the inside, on the outside, will be stronger now in many places, uh, not necessarily in Gaza, uh, but whether in the West Bank or in uh, neighboring countries or in refugee camps. Um, Hamas is also the idea of armed resistance. Now, just as Israel claims the right to self-defense, uh, which it has, uh, the Palestinians have the right to resist the illegal occupation. Both of those should be conducted within the confines of international law, neither are. Um, but the idea of resistance will live on long beyond whatever percentage of Hamas fighting capacity uh, is degraded in Gaza. So I would say not only is this question of eliminating Hamas uh, A, at what cost, B, I don't think you can do it anyway. C, Israel has been coexisting with Hamas. And in fact, there's Israel reveled in this divide and rule approach. Israel was protective of uh, preventing uh, the handing over of uh, governance in Gaza to a unity Palestinian political formation. Um, now, I realize that, that there is this idea that, well, Israel can't possibly live next door to a Gaza that still has Hamas in it. Um, I don't understand why it would be so difficult at the same time to entertain the notion that how could Palestinians possibly be expected to live next door to a state that uh, barely batting an eyelid has just killed 5,000 children. Uh, the number goes up every minute or every day, every hour, uh, and uh, uh, you know, in excess of 10,000 uh, civilians overall. You don't get to choose those things. And you certainly don't get to achieve a dignified peace without which Israel will not have security. And I'm tough on Israel. I know the system from the inside. A lot of my pain is for Palestinians, but a lot of my pain is for Israelis who are not going to know security. But they're also not gonna know the freedom of not denying others freedom while we still live with this bloody horrible occupation. So, you know, I would argue you don't get security if you don't have a dignified peace. And, you know, part of the, the, the misframing of this is you need people, you need Hamas inside the agreement, I would argue. And I think it's possible, it was possible. The 2017 change in the Hamas charter was about that the prisoners docking up between Hamas and Fatah a decade earlier, those were about creating a unified Palestinian movement that yes, would lean more into resistance as a strategy, but would also be available to make reasonable, not unreasonable, but reasonable compromises. The other thing I would just say, because we haven't spoken about it, perhaps because it almost goes without saying, but I think it is important to say is, um, that's going to be how Israel gets the, the Israeli hostages and prisoners of war out alive. Th there is a choice here. And the, those who were released already um, were released as a result not of a, of a daring Israeli rescue mission, but not as a result of the pressure that was applied during the uh, ground incursion, despite Israeli claims to the contrary. I was briefed on the twenty. 5th, I believe it was, of October, on the details of the negotiated release package, and they don't look very different to what was ultimately implemented. So there is a choice. Either Israel is going to pursue the military mission, and many of those being held will perish, uh, or it is going to prioritize uh, getting those people back. If I may, just one more thought. The, the, the administration um, 
you know, is talking about getting tough on extremist settlers as if there's this thing called settler land, which exists independently of the state of Israel. You, you, you can't get, you, Israel arms, funds, backs, has an ideological predisposition which the settlers are pursuing. But I do want to say this, um, not to contradict Dana, because I think she accurately depicted Israeli politics, but, but to add just maybe a smidgen of optimism in that respect into the mix, because I think um, at a time of, of such a shock and disruption, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. And yes, it, the Israeli narratives have gone much more hawkish. But I also think people are genuinely pissed at the where the extremists in the government have taken them, many people. And I think, I think there are openings, but part of the disruption of this event could create openings uh, in Israeli society. And, I, and, I, and in that respect, I want to say this, there have been some remarkable um, mobilizations on the part of the families of those being held in Gaza. Now, now you know, naturally, you know, they're, they're, in a, they're in a terrible situation. But some of those showdowns between members of the Israeli parliament, members of the coalition, and the families who have been screaming and shouting at them, not just to get my people out, but they've actually been challenging them politically on how their political approach is the wrong approach. Like I said, I don't want to be Pollyannish. I don't want to kind of find silver linings where they don't exist. But I think there is there is a thread there. And it's a thread that it's just worth being aware of. Daniel, I appreciate that a lot. I'm reminded by the psalm, Vebachauta Bachaim, and you choose life as a driving force. I've seen hostage families carry in their voices. Um, I wanted to uh, move on to a question from the Q&A section of the Zoom um, and, and, and ask Paul. Uh, someone asked about assault weapons to Israeli settlers as a possible wedge issue. Um, given the reluctance of Congress people to, to call for a ceasefire. Um, but I also think that this brings up a larger question about the Israel supplemental and the idea that U.S. weapons are being used to support this military offensive, despite repeated concerns of civilian protection and violations of international law raised by both members of Congress and the administration. So could you explain your perspective on this, please? Well, it ties in very directly with uh, our topic of the day, which is, you know, ceasefire or no ceasefire, because, you know, how any further U.S. weapons provided to Israel would be used uh, depends on that. If we don't have a ceasefire, then, you know, they're going to be used for the main effort of the Israeli Defense Forces uh, right now, which is uh, wreaking havoc on the, on the Gaza Strip with all of the costs and consequences we've talked about. If we had a ceasefire... Uh, then I think a more legitimate case can be made that uh, further aid to Israel would would be defense, you know, whether most of it would go into, you know, beefing up the Iron Dome system or what have you. Uh, but at least it would not be be getting used actively as we speak in inflicting the kind of death and destruction that we've been witnessing over the last several weeks. I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. Um, and. As we wrap up, I'd like to ask both of you to give a, a minute or two of a, of a con concluding words. And I, I just want to flag that there are a lot of staffers on this call who want to take action and be helpful to reduce the violence. So keep in mind uh, in your answers, what, what would you like to see lawmakers do right now? Um, thank you. Let's start with Daniel. You, you, we, yeah, I think Paul and myself are looking at you because we heard let's start with and then we didn't hear a name after that. I said Daniel, I'm sorry. Daniel, oh, okay. yeah. sorry. sorry. Um, you, you will know your own uh, immediate political environment better than I. Um, I think it would be useful to have greater transparency uh, to the extent to which that doesn't exist, and I don't think it does exist, uh, on what weaponry is being sent uh, by the US and to what use um, is it being put. Um, I do not believe that given the political will 
America cannot use the enormous leverage uh, it has vis-a-vis -vis Israel, not only in the immediate term, although the immediate term is the one that is most pressing, but also well beyond that. Uh, and I would just say that I think this is a question. I think I think some people say, look, you know, Biden doesn't want to call for something and then not be able to deliver it. I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is, he, is he willing to maintain um, a serious gap uh, in positions uh, and sustain that and lean into that if necessary uh, between himself and the Israeli leadership? I, I follow the political reporting from your country. Um, it doesn't seem to be smart politics on his part either, but others will have a better uh, sight on that. And then the last thing I would say is we got here we got to a situation whereby Israel could act with such complacency, could believe that it that it could avoid making hard choices on the Palestinian question, that it could e keep Gaza as an open air prison, that it can maintain a blockade for a decade and a half, not to mention what is done in the West Bank. We got there to such insecurity for Israel and such arrogance and hubris that October 7th was able to happen. We got there in no small measure because Impunity is the worst lesson that one can send uh, as a friend. Uh, and I, in that respect, to trot out that old gem, uh, America has not acted in that respect as a friend. And I think impunity has been the handmaiden to extremism and extremism is the handmaiden to overreach. And those things are very dangerous, uh, of course, for the Palestinians, but also for Israel. And so I do think that the the word accountability needs to enter the lexicon. I don't have that hope that America will, will generate that, but I think that is what we should be driving towards. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Well, I, I don't have, unfortunately, much more hope than Daniel does in terms of the American political process, but you asked you know, what I'd really like to see out of Congress right now, just to, to simplify it, two things. One is a clear call for a ceasefire in the current uh, warfare, uh, even if it's a non-binding resolution. And secondly, uh, to exercise for the first time uh, since uh, maybe 30 years ago during the George H.W. Bush administration, use of some of that leverage by applying conditions uh, to any further aid, including not just the supplemental, but the, uh, you know, the existing annual 3.8 billion. Uh, the particular conditions and terms would have to be carefully drafted, but I think they would uh, involve, among other things, uh, observing the laws of war. Um, not uh, uh, not not inflicting on civilians the kind of casualties we've seen, and you could also bring in the question about the West Bank settlers and you know what Ben Gavir is doing with arming them and so on. That would be part of it too. And in any congressional action, either with regard to calling for a ceasefire or applying conditions to aid, I would encourage putting language in that covers some of the points we've made during the past hour that this is just not just a matter of U.S. interests differing from Israeli interest, although there are significant ways in which they do, but that the best way to provide security for Israel's own citizens is to change from the course that uh, their government has uh, unfortunately been placed on uh, and to reaffirm that, uh, you know, to use Daniel's words, uh, you know, we have pain for Israelis as well as for Palestinians and that uh, for the, for the, the big brother patron to be a real friend, uh, as, as he put it, impunity is not the answer, but uh, guidance toward a, a more secure future for Israelis as well as Palestinians is part of that. I would include language to that effect in any congressional action. I appreciate uh, both of you so much and Donna as well for joining us today and giving your really, really important perspectives um, on this issue. I wanna thank everyone who came so much for coming. Please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with the recording of this briefing and for the resources. If you have any follow-up questions about the briefing or from the panelists, you can email kvan at demandprogress.org, which is C-A-V-A-N at demandprogress.org. We appreciate you showing up and thanks again for coming, everybody. <laughs>